Good morning and welcome to Cornerstone Church this morning. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 8. 2 Kings chapter 8. And we want to look again at this wonderful book and the life of the prophet Elisha and those who served with him. And today we want to pick up at verse 16 and look at from that verse all the way to the end of this chapter. Now, last week, we looked at this man Hazael and Ben-Hadad from Syria, but now the attention of the writer will turn back to the nations of Israel and Judah. If you remember, at this time in his history, the kingdom is divided between the north and the south. Ten tribes made up the northern kingdom of Israel, sometimes called the kingdom of Samaria. And then two tribes really made up the kingdom of Judah, the descendants of King David, and that was made up of the tribe of Benjamin and Judah. Now, in verse 16, we're told in the fifth year of Joram, or Jehoram, sometimes he's called, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being then king of Judah, Jehoraham, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Now, there is some confusion over whether the Joram or Jehoram is actually the same person because of the intermarriage between the son of Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab. Some believe that Ahab had a son called Joram, sometimes called Jehoram, and he is different from the son of Jehoshaphat called Jehoram or Joram. Others say, no, they're actually the two uh, the two names of the two kings refer to the same person. And actually what was happening was that because of this intermarriage of the son of Jehoshaphat with the daughter of Ahab, that there was a kind of co-regency. When Jehoshaphat was reigning, his son was a co-regent, but also his son was reigning over the kingdom of Israel. We just don't know exactly. But what we do know is that Jehoshaphat had a son, Jehoram. And this son of Jehoshaphat married Athaliah, the daughter of King Ahab. And that united the two royal families of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom and built a political and military alliance between these two rival kingdoms. And now what we find is the moral wall of separation between the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel has now crumbled. And what you're going to see now is that the sin and evil of the north is going to flood into the kingdom of Judah in the south. Now, Jehoram or Joram, the name is a good name. It means Jehovah is exalted. And this son of Jehoshaphat, he had a good name. He had a good father. Jehoshaphat was one of the godliest kings of Judah. But sad to say, he wasn't a godly man. And it's a reminder to us all right up front that having a good name, growing up in a good home, is not enough. That those things don't guarantee spirituality. Grace does not flow in the DNA. Now, this man, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, we're told in verse 17, was 32 years of age when he began to reign. And he's going to reign till the age of 48 years on the throne of Judah. Now, what type of man was he? Verse 18 sums it up. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. So instead of walking according to the traditions and beliefs and practices of his godly father Jehoshaphat and the kingdom of Judah, he followed the practices, the values, the beliefs of the northern kingdom led by Ahab of the house of Israel. Now, why was he so influenced to walk in such ways? Verse 18 tells us, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So we're told that a key influence on Jehoram that made, uh, led him, that catalyzed him, that encouraged him to live such an ungodly life, 
was his marriage into the ungodly family of Ahab. Now, we are more often, sad to say, influenced by sinners than by saints. Sad but true for many people. Indeed, you could say for most people. And it says that he did evil at the end of verse 18 in the sight of the Lord. Now, that expression has the idea that he does sin, he does evil in a very public way. It's as if he doesn't care that God can see what he's up to. He's someone who's unafraid. He's no fear of God. He rebels in a very public way. He transgresses in a very transparent way. He, he doesn't do this in secret. He's not practicing immorality and idolatry behind closed doors. Here's a man catalyzed by his ungodly wife and his ungodly in-laws who rises up in the kingdom of Judah that was previously led by his godly father Jehoshaphat and he publicly undoes and unravels all the laws and the values that his father had laid down when he was king. Now, what detail do we have of his behavior as king? Well, if you turn to 2 Chronicles and chapter 21, it's a parallel account, but it's an account that gives us a little bit more detail of what's going on in the kingdom of Judah under Jehoram. And in the detail, we see a number of terrible things that was prominent in the life of Jehoram. We're told in verse 5 that Jehoram was 30 and 2 years when he began to reign, and he reigned 8 years in Jerusalem. So it's the same Jehoram. Now, what type of man was he? What type of reign did he have? Well, when he took over from his father, verse 2 tells us, he had a number of brothers, Azariah, and Jehiel, and Zechariah, and Azariah, and Michael, and Shept, Hathiah. These were all the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. So these had great names too. These were sons that Jehoshaphat no doubt hoped would lead his nation after his death, along with his oldest son, Jehoram. And the father gave them gifts so that they could live with their families and rule with their families. We're told in verse 3, he gave great gifts of silver and of gold and of precious things, fenced cities, but the kingdom gave he to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. So this man, Jehoshaphat, he was fair. He, he was a godly man. And God had prospered him economically and financially, materially, because he was such a godly man. And he looked across all of his sons and he gave them good names. I wish I had time to go through them all. But you can look it up for yourself. And he gave them good names and he gave them a great inheritance, a great start in life. And no doubt he hoped and he prayed that all of his sons and his grandchildren would ra rise up and live for God in the next generation. But notice what happens. Verse 4. Now when Jehoram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself, so he got himself prepared. This was not done rashly or randomly. He, he waited until he had the right power base built up, the right authority, no doubt, the, the right ruthless murderers and elite troops around him that would be loyal to him and do whatever evil thing he sanctioned. And then we're told this, he slew all his brethren with the sword and divers also of the princes of Israel. And you get an impression straight away, here's a paranoid individual. Here's a ruthless individual. Here's a man endued with the values of the ungodly that dares not to have any rival, potential rival. He's insecure. He's afraid. And he's not just insecure and afraid. He begins a reign of terror by massacring all his relatives, and even not just all his brothers and their families, but he murders his nieces, his nephews, and even any princes of Israel that potentially could be a rival to him, he massacres them all. And you see a man like Stalin here, just killing everybody, just afraid, paranoid, 
about any potential rival. And you know, even Ahab, who he walked after, didn't do this. Here, here's a man out of control, beginning a reign of terror in his kingdom. There's an old saying, isn't there? Uneasy is the head that wears the crown. In other words, the one who has leadership is always afraid of losing it, especially if he's not walking with God. And Jehoram, because he has no fear of God, no respect for God's sovereignty, like his uh, relative Ahab, he has no fear of God in murdering others, even murdering family and friends. So that's the first thing we see in his reign, ruthless, bloodthirsty. But then we see something else, because in verse 11 of the same chapter, we're told, moreover, he, speaking of Jehoram, 2 Chronicles 21, made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit fornication and compelled Judah thereto. So he not only was an immoral, bloodthirsty murderer himself, but he also then introduced the, all the false worship of Baal from the house of Ahab. He brought it into Judah and he compelled the people in Judah. In other words, he forced this through as the state religion and they committed fornication. In other words, they were indulged in sexual immorality, in false worship, in no doubt offering their little children as altar, as sacrifices to Baal. It was the most appalling, immoral, wicked, vile religion. And he brought it into the kingdom of Judah. And of course, no doubt who was encouraging him to do this would have been Athaliah, the ungodly daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. And you know, this marriage between Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, and Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab, no doubt seemed politically to be a good idea to unite these two smaller kingdoms, especially when they were surrounded by larger kingdoms like Syria, kingdoms that threatened them. Politically, it made sense. Economically, no doubt it made sense. Historically, it made sense because they were once one nation. From an ethnic point of view, it made sense because they were all from the 12 tribes, all descended from Jacob. So for all these outward reasons, this union made sense, but it was a spiritual calamity, tragedy for the nation of Judah. And it's a reminder to us all right up front, be very careful of the company you keep. Be very careful of the relationships that you have. Evil company, and Ahab was about as evil and Jezebel, as evil company as you can imagine, produces evil fruit. That day when Jehoshaphat went from Jerusalem up to Samaria to meet Ahab, began to have an alliance with Ahab, he never guessed that by the end of the process, not only would he and Ahab be in relationship, but his son Jehoram would marry Ahab's daughter and it would bring all kinds of calamity, not just to his own family, because Jehoram would be encouraged to murder all the siblings, all the sons of Jehoshaphat, but it would bring a worse calamity to the nation of Judah. And you know, we need to be very careful who we form relationships with, particularly when it comes to marriage. You know, if you marry an unbeliever, when you marry that person, you are inviting the devil into your home. Because the Bible tells us that when you marry an unbeliever, a non-Christian, the devil becomes your father-in-law because every unbeliever is of their father, the devil. And that day when Jehoram married Athaliah, he was inviting Satan into his kingdom. And you know, we might try to tell ourselves that if we marry an unbeliever, if we date an unbeliever, that we can have a good influence on them. Sad to say, that's rarely the case. It's usually the other way. Just as in the force of gravity, it's easier to pull someone down than pull someone up. The same is true spiritually. 
It's easier to be pulled down than to be pulled up. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have acquaintances and even some friendships with unbelievers. We are called to be salt and light. We are called to be witnesses to the unsaved around us in the workplace, in the family circle, in the neighborhood. And that involves us showing kindness and friendship even to unbelievers. How else can we reach them for Jesus Christ if we lock ourselves away like hermits in a cave? But saying all of that, we're not to make them our bosom buddies. We're not to have spiritual fellowship or attempt to have spiritual fellowship with them. They're not to be people that we share our problems with, open our hearts to. Those are the people we should do that with are always the people of God. There are two brothers who founded the Methodist movement. Their names are very familiar to us. John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Both John and Charles were very godly men, and both of them were great preachers. And in Charles's case, he was a great musician and a great hymn writer. And we still love to sing his hymns like, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. But Charles Wesley, after he had got married, had a number of children, but only three of them really survived to adulthood. And he had two boys in particular that he was very proud of. And those two boys inherited the genius of their father when it came to music. One of the boys was called Charles Jr. And the other boy he called Samuel Wesley. And Charles wanted those two boys to become great musicians. And no doubt he hoped and he prayed that they would take the musical talent that God had gifted them and use it for the glory of God. And in order to make them the very best at music, he decided he would send them away, as was the custom in those days, to live with the greatest musicians that he knew. And what would happen is they would go and spend time with those musicians, maybe three months, six months in their home, and they would follow them around and they would learn their habits of practice and the, the style of music that they were uh, drawn to and would create. And then they would move on to someone else. And John Wesley was very concerned about Charles sending his two sons away from the home, particularly sending them to the homes of ungodly musicians. And he spoke to his brother Charles and he said, you shouldn't do this. Because if you put your two young boys in the home of ungodly people and let them live among them, listen to their language, their vocabulary, watch their example, it won't be long before those two impressionable young boys start to walk in the footsteps of their heroes. Well, Charles, he wouldn't listen to his big brother, John. He said, no, I've decided to do this. And he sent the two boys away. And over time, just as he had hoped, the two boys became brilliant musicians. In fact, Samuel in particular was called the English Mozart by many of his contemporaries. Charles Jr., he played for the king. He was such an accomplished musician. But sad to say, John's prediction also came true because the two boys didn't just imbibe the musical talents and gifts and styles of their heroes and their teachers, but they also imbibed their values. And both Charles Wesley Jr., and Samuel Wesley became highly ungodly men. And Samuel in particular was so ungodly that he left his wife and had four illegitimate children with another woman. And both Samuel and Charles broke their father's heart, Charles Sr., because they walked not in according to his ways, but according to the ways of the ungodly that they hung around with. What a tragedy. What a disaster. What heartbreak for the father. And the same with Jehoram here. Jehoshaphat never intended that day when he went up to hang around with Ahab that his son Jehoram would become just like the house of Ahab. Never, never dreamt that would happen, but it happened. And as a warning to you and I, be careful of the company that you keep. Be careful of the company that you introduce your family to. Be 
those around you too. But then go back to 2 Kings chapter 8. It says in verse 19 that God still shows mercy. Now, it's not because Jehoram had not invoked the judgment of God. He fully deserved to be destroyed and his kingdom to be destroyed and his name to be erased from off the earth for the sins of Jehoram. But it says, yet the Lord would not destroy Judah. Why? Because Jehoram was a good person? No. Because Jehoram hadn't sinned enough? No. But it says, for David, his servant's sake, as he had promised him to give him all way of light and to his children. In other words, God says, I had made a promise to King David, the father of this house, through Solomon, Rehoboam, and down all the way to Jehoram, that I would not wipe out David's descendants, that I would always leave a light for him among the kings of Israel and Judah. And because I have made a covenant, a promise, and I, Jehovah, cannot break my promise, I didn't wipe out Jehoram and all of his descendants. And you know, there's a lesson there again for you and I. Walking with God brings blessing not just to our immediate generation, but down the generations. And you'll see that over and over and over again. I was reading a story just this week of two families in the United States who really grew up in the 17th century. One was godly, one was ungodly. The ungodly family was a man led by, called Max Dukes, who married a very ungodly woman. And from their descendants, a magazine did an analysis and they discovered that of their 1900 descendants, that came through a number of generations, that almost 800 of them were criminals, that 250 of them were arrested for other offenses, that 60 were thieves, and 40 almost were convicted for murder, all coming from an ungodly couple. But then they compared them with another family that started at the same time, the Edwards family, Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards, his family made up 1,344 descendants. Of those 1,344, they discovered that 186 became ministers or missionaries of the gospel. 86 were senators. Three became congressmen, 30 judges. One of them even became the vice president of the United States. And not a single one was ever convicted of a criminal offense or ever ended up in jail. See what can happen when a godly father and mother seek to rise up and form a godly family unit by the grace of God, it can bring multitudes of years, multitudes of blessing, years and years of grace flowing through generations. I'm always moved when I think of the family of James Hudson Taylor, the founder of the China Inland Mission. And about 20 years ago, I went to a little meeting in Singapore in a place called Cliney Road to a little building there owned by the Overseas Missionaries Fellowship. When I went there, the speaker was a man, James Hudson Taylor IV, I believe he was. And he told us that he was the eighth generation of the descendants of James Hudson Taylor. And eight generations they can now trace of missionaries and pastors and preachers who had gone to preach the gospel, gone to serve the Lord in many different parts of the world. And what a blessing that is to see God working through generations. We were looking at last week, Amram and Jochebed and Miriam. And it was so interesting to observe how, although Amram and Jochebed were slaves and grew up in Egypt with nothing, they owned nothing, they were nothing. They were at the very bottom of the ladder socially. Probably they didn't even have a home to live in. They may have just lived in a tent or a shelter of some sort. And yet that couple who were at the bottom of the social ladder 
saw God work in their children. And of their three children, the first one, Miriam, was the first one that was called the prophetess in the Bible. She was the first female that God honored to raise up to lead other women. And she didn't just lead a few women. She took two million Israelite women. And after they came through the Red Sea, she lifted up her timbrel and led them in worship to honor the Lord. And Miriam lived to around 130 years of age. And during that long life, God used her in a wonderful way, in many different decades, in many different scenarios. And then her other brother, her first brother, Aaron, became the first high priest of the nation of Israel. And God used him in a wonderful way. And then, of course, her youngest brother was the most famous of all, Moses the one who wrote the first five books of the Bible, the mighty prince of Egypt, the one who was learned in all the wisdom and knowledge of the Egyptian, mighty in word and deed, the Bible calls him. And all those three children who influenced not just Jewish history, Bible history, but world history, all three of them came from a very simple home where their dad and their mom covenanted their children before God to give them to the Lord so that God could use them. And they decided they would honor God over the king's commandment. And what a blessing unfolded through that home, through those generations. But let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 8. Because we're told in verse 20, God begins to put his finger, although God wouldn't destroy the whole line of King David by killing Jehoram and all of his descendants because he had a promise, he had given his word to King David never to do that. That doesn't mean that God ignored what was going on by Jehoram and his wicked wife, Athaliah, because we're told in his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. King David had put down the Edomites. Now, the Edomites were the descendants of Esau, if you remember, Isaac had two sons, twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Esau was the oldest, Jacob was the younger of the twin. But God chose Jacob. And through Jacob, he established the Messianic covenant all the way down to the Lord Jesus Christ through the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob. But in that blessing, there was also a warning because Esau was also given a blessing by Isaac. And Isaac was told in or Isaac predicted, because he was a prophet, way back in Genesis chapter 27 and verse 38, that the younger would rule over the older. And it says in verse 39, after Esau asked for a blessing, he says, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above, and by thy sword shalt thou live, and it shall, thou shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Hundreds of years before, God promised Esau through a prophecy of Isaac that he would be conquered by the descendants of Jacob, but one day he would rise up in strength and break the yoke of the descendants of Jacob. And now hundreds of years later, in verse 20 of 2 Kings chapter 8, that prophecy becomes true. And we're told, Edom, the descendants of Esau. Now you'll see on the map that the Edomites lived near the Israelites. Today, we believe the capital city of the Edomite kingdom is Petra. Some of you no doubt have been to Petra when you visit the land of Jordan, if you're heading over to the Middle East. Now, the Edomites were conquered by King David, put under tribute and under subjection. But the first sign of the cracking of the power base of Jehoram, because remember, he married Athaliah in order to consolidate the two kingdoms, in order to make them diplomatically, militarily, economically strong. The first cracks begin to form, and now the Edomites overthrow them, revolt against them. And we're told Jehoram, or Joram as he's called in verse 21, went over to Zaire 
and all the chariots with him, and he rose by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about, and the captains of the chariots and the people fled into their tents. So Jehoram goes over to try and punish, to try and put down the rebellion. And although initially he succeeds, very quickly it appears his army disappeared and left him. But if that wasn't bad enough, we're told in verse 22, yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. So in the end, he lost one of his big economic and military successes turned out to be a failure. And he lost part of the kingdom that was handed to him by his father, Jehoshaphat. But then another one, verse 22, then Libna revolted at the same time. So things are falling apart from bad to worse now. Now, Libna was a Levitical city. Why does it revolt from Jehoram? What's the reason? Well, if you go to 2 Chronicles 21 again, in verse 10, we're told, So the Edomites revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. The same time also did Libna revolt from under his hand. And then there's a little semicolon, because we're going to get the explanation. Was it bad luck? Was it because he took his eye off the ball? Was it because their armies were strategically more capable than his army? Well, here's the answer, the real answer, the ultimate answer. Because he had forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. In other words, the reason things begin to fall apart for Jehoram in his kingdom was because God started to shake it. God started coming after him. God's finger was on him. And you know, the same will be true in your life. The moment a Christian or a professing child of God starts to sin, expect God to respond. Expect God to come after him. And something else very interesting happens in 2 Chronicles chapter 21. Because in verse 12, God was very gracious to Jehoram. He didn't leave him in ignorance because there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet. Now, Elijah had already gone to heaven, we believe, by this point in the chariot and in the whirlwind. But he left a writing. No doubt God had moved upon Elijah to leave this manuscript. And it was brought now to Jehoram, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of David thy father, because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa king of Judah, but has walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to go a whoring like to the whoredoms of the house of Ahab, and has also slain thy brethren of thy father's house, which are better than thyself. Behold, with a great plague will the Lord smite thy people and thy children, and thy wives, and all thy goods. And thou shalt have great sickness by disease of thy bowels, until thy bowels fall out by reason of the sickness day by day. God says to Jehoram through a message from Elijah, who was already in heaven by this point, that the problems you're now facing are a direct consequence of your sin. The material problems, the financial problems, the military problems, the diplomatic problems are all linked to your rebellion against God. And God warns him, and this is grace by God, not only to tell him the causal link, but to tell him that God's now going to smite him with a terrible disease of his intestines, his bowels. And sure enough, we're told that God does exactly that. Because we're told in verse 18 of 2 Chronicles 21, this really is linked back to 2 Kings chapter 8, but let's read 2 Chronicles 21, verse 18. And after all this, so after all the warning, and this was grace to him, it's giving him an opportunity to repent, is giving him time to consider his rebellion against God, to deal with his stubbornness, his idolatry, his immorality, and cry unto God for mercy. But it says, after all this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable disease. We don't know exactly what that means. Maybe it was a type of cancer in the intestines. But we're told it was so bad 
that in the process of time his bowels fell out by reason of his disease sickness and he died of sore diseases. In other words, he had a long, lingering and excruciatingly painful death, humiliating death, shameful death. And the people made no burning for him like the burning of his fast. After he died, no one mourned, no one cared. He was a rotten king, an evil king, a ruthless king. And he left this world without a single soul to mourn over him. And verse 30 tells us he desired to be buried in the kingdom of David, in the sepulchres of the kings. Howbeit they buried him in the city of David, but not in the sepulchres of the kings. He died in shame. He died a humiliating death, and even his burial was humiliating and shameful. He was deemed not worthy to be in the sepulchre of the kings. Now, what's going to happen next? Verse 25 of 2 Kings chapter 8. Jehoram, terrible king. Jehoram did terrible things. Jehoram died a terrible death. So what comes next for the kingdom of Judah? Will we have a godly king next? Sadly not. Verse 25. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. He was two and twenty years old when he began to reign. He reigned one year in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab. What a tragedy. The wicked Jehoram dying in such agony under such judgment of God, it had no effect on his son because his son did exactly the same. And you know, the name Ahaziah means Jehovah possesses or Jehovah holds. Another man with a good name, but another man with a terrible life. Now, what's the author of the book doing? in giving us this detail about Jehoram and his son Ahaziah. What he's doing is he's letting you and I see that the kingdom of Judah now was just as wicked as the kingdom of Israel. That God now has allowed these two kingdoms to become intertwined morally, materially, diplomatically, legally, but also spiritually. And God now is going to have to clean house. He's going to have to pour out his judgment upon the two families in the two kingdoms. And in the next chapter, you're going to see how God does that and prepares the way for a new generation of leaders. Now, let me wrap this up by saying, what, what's the big lessons that we learn from this story? Of course, the great lesson is beware of bad company, isn't it? If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church in Corinth, a city that was famous all over the Roman Empire for its immorality and idolatry. It was sin city of the empire of 100 million people. And even the ungodly looked upon the city of Corinth as the capital city of sin. And Paul, writing to Christians in that city, in that little church, who no doubt were wealthy, because it was a very wealthy place, but he wrote to warn them of the dangers of being too close to the sinners in the city of Corinth. And he said this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. He said, be not deceived. Now, that's just a way of saying, don't fool yourself, don't kid yourself. He says, don't kid yourself. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Now, what does he mean by evil communications corrupt good manners? Evil communications has the idea of evil behavior, evil conversations, evil companions, hanging around with the ungodly, talking to them, befriending them, laughing with them joking with them, making them your buddies, hanging out with them as your close friends. And Paul says, if you're a believer in Corinth, he says, be not deceived, don't kid yourself. If you hang around with the idolatrous, immoral, immoral people of Corinth, 
and make them your friends, your acquaintances, your companions, that their behavior, their values, like an osmosis, will corrupt your life. They'll get into your mind, they'll get into your heart, and they'll get a grip of you. They'll corrupt you. And he says, be not deceived. Don't let the devil tell you that you can walk with God and still walk with them, and it won't be affected. He says it will. They will corrupt good manners. They'll corrupt your values. You see that with Lot in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, how that his values started to be perverted by the men of Sodom. And even when the angels came that day and the men of Sodom wanted to break down the door of his house to attack the angels, to engage in grossly immoral acts with the angels, what does Lot do? He says, take my two daughters, my two beautiful virgin daughters, he says, go and corrupt them. Imagine a father saying that to the men of Sodom. It shows how Lot's values had been influenced by the Sodomites, from living among them, from laughing with them, from joking with them, from hanging around with them, he started to think like them. Do you know, there's an old expression, if you lie down with dogs, you'll get the fleece. You'll get fleas. It's true. Paul says, don't kid yourself. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Let me give you another illustration of this. Turn to Judges chapter 14 in your Bible. And with this, we'll close this illustration. And this is, like Lot, this is another example to warn us about who we hang around with because we're told in verse, 14, verse 1 of Judges 14 about this man, Samson, a man who had godly parents, who had a great upbringing, but who decided he wasn't going to listen we're told in verse 1 of chapter 14, and Samson went down to Timnath. Now, where was Timnath? It's in the land of the Philistines. Where was Samson called to serve the Lord? In the land of Israel. Where was he told not to go down to? The land of the Philistines. They were the enemy. They were immoral. They were godless. They were idolaters. And the Philistines were not the right people for Samson to be with. He certainly shouldn't have been making friendships with them. He certainly, certainly shouldn't have been partying with them. And he certainly shouldn't have been trying to set up marital relationships with the Philistine woman. But notice what happens. He goes down to Timnath, where he shouldn't be. And it says, and he saw a woman. Oh, the devil always has a woman in the wrong place. If you're in the wrong place. And he has a woman that he knows will attract Samson a daughter of the Philistines. No doubt she's beautiful. No doubt she's sensual. No doubt she has all the attractive values of looks of the world. And Samson wants her. And we're told he goes to his parents and he says to them in verse 2, I've seen a woman of the Timnath land. Now therefore get her for me to wife. He doesn't ask permission. He doesn't seek their counsel, their wisdom. He just says, I'm marrying her. I'm having her. I'm lusting after her. Not because she's spiritual, because he says he saw her, saw her outward physical features, and it lust, it's provoked his sensual lusts. And he says to his parents, get her for me. And his dad and mom began to reason with him in verse 3, and they said, this is wrong, Samson. You shouldn't be there, and you certainly shouldn't be forming a relationship with an ungodly Philistine woman. And you know what Samson said to them at the end of verse 3? Get her for me, for she pleases me. In other words, he said to his father, shut up. Don't argue with me. I know better. I want her. And that's all that matters. And you know, Samson, like a fool, formed this relationship with a woman that he thought loved him. And you discover as you read the story, not only does she let him down, but she humiliates him. And the whole story ends in tears. Disaster. A broken testimony and a destroyed home. But does Samson learn the lesson? No. Because the next chapter and the chapter after tells us he just kept on going this way. Kept on forming wrong relationships with wrong people and getting into disaster after disaster after disaster. And why do God's people make this mistake? 
And I think the answer is Satan is a master of making sin look attractive. And he makes the daughters and sons of the devil look very attractive companions. And when young people in particular from Christian homes, they go out into the world, they see these sons and daughters of hell. I know they look to have fun. They look like they're enjoying themselves. The clubs and the pubs and all the other places of sin, all, all, they look so happy. And the advertisements feed into this and the peer pressure feeds into this that if you form relationships with these people, you'll be free like them. You'll be happy like them. You'll be joyful like them. You don't have to hang around with all these narrow-minded Christian people. Go out and sow your wild oats and enjoy. But you see, just as Samson found, you can sow the wild oats, but you discover that there's a harvest day one day. Because just as you sow the seed, so the seed brings forth fruit. And the fruit is often an evil fruit. And why did Samson feel so badly in all of his relationship? Because Samson never learned to control his emotions. Whatever he saw, he wanted. He wasn't able to bring his emotions, his desires, under the control of the Spirit of God. He was empowered by the Spirit of God at times, but he never allowed himself to be completely surrendered and controlled by the Spirit of God. And you know, I'm looking at you this evening or this morning, wherever you are in the world. And you know, you may ask yourself this question, why can't I deal with the problems of my emotions. Why do I constantly come to church angry and leave angry? Why do I come to church bitter and leave bitter? Why do I come to church frustrated and leave frustrated? Why do I come to church with these evil desires and then I go out from church and I still got them? Why do I come to church with besetting sins and leave with the same besetting sins controlling me and overcoming me? Why do I come in defeated and leave defeated? Why can't I get the victory? And you know, the real answer is this. We never deal with the root of the problem. You know, if you're a gardener, you learn this lesson very, very quickly. In order to destroy weeds, you have to dig up the root. If you just cut the top of the weed and leave it there, very quickly, you'll suddenly discover the weed comes back again. And the only way to kill the weed, destroy the weed from coming back, is to dig it up at the root and root out every part of that root and destroy the root. And you know, the Bible says that's the same with sin. You have to deal with the root of bitterness, the root of sin. You have to dig it up in your life. Paul says in the book of Romans, make no provision for the flesh. In other words, you have to cut it off from the root. And you know, if you want to have good relationships, you have to have sometimes broken relationships. You have to cut out the bad relationships. You have to cut off, the, cut off the bad friendships and cut off the places that you form those bad friendships. And that's true in every area of our life. Samson didn't do with it. Lot didn't do it. And you and I need to do it. Jehoshaphat made the mistake like Samson and Lot in not digging up the root of bad companionship. And it cost him everything and subsequent generations. What lessons do we learn from this story? Let me wrap it up with four very simple statements. We'll put them on the screen. Lesson number one, bad company will always corrupt. Bad company will always corrupt. That, that's a given. The Bible doesn't say that's a probability. It's not just a possibility, it's a promise. Bad company will always bring bad fruit, bad corrupt things in your life. But then the second thing we learn from the story is this, bad company will have long-term consequences. It's not just the immediate failure that it brings, shame that it brings to Jehoshaphat. 
But you discover even after the death of Jehoshaphat, the evil seeds that were sown by that bad companionship with Ahab, that bad relationship he had with Ahab, the seeds that were sown there produced fruit, not just in his lifetime, but throughout the generations. And even today we're talking about the failure of Jehoshaphat, what shame it brought to him and his great reputation. But then the third thing we learn from this story is this, bad company can be avoided. Jehoshaphat didn't have to enter into this relationship with Ahab. If he hadn't have, Jehoram would probably have never met Athaliah, would never have got married to Athaliah. And all of the things that you see flowing from that relationship could have been avoided. Lot made the choice to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. Ahab made the choice, or Abraham made the choice, you remember, not to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. But then the last thing we want to end on the positive note to learn from the story is this. Bad company cannot help you spiritually, but good company can. That's the good news. You know, you don't always have to see things one way because there's a converse position here. Just as bad company corrupts you spiritually, and your descendants spiritually, the opposite is true. Good company can bring great spiritual benefit in your life. What a blessing Jonathan was to King David. In his darkest days, we're told that Jonathan would come and encourage David in the Lord, help David to go on spiritually, help David to walk with God spiritually. And good company, good company can be a great help to you and I make good friends of God's people, make good relationships with God's people. Look at Joseph, what a blessing he was to those around him, to Potiphar, to Pharaoh. Look at Daniel, what, what, a, what an influence he had walking with God on Darius, on Nebuchadnezzar. But avoid bad companies. We love to sing a hymn. In our church, come thou fount of every blessing, written by Robert Robinson. And yet this tragic story of Robert Robinson was that he was a minister who, who professed to walk with God, wrote that wonderful hymn. But then he started to hang around with an ungodly man called Joseph Priestley, a very intellectual man, a man who is said to have discovered oxygen. And his friends warned him, don't hang around with Priestley because Priestley is an atheist or deist, which is really a fancy name for an atheist, an ungodly man. Robert Robinson wouldn't listen. It wasn't long before the values and thoughts of this great genius, Joseph Priestley, began to get into the heart and mind of Robert Robinson. So much so that after a while, he decided that he could no longer be a minister of the gospel. He resigned from the ministry and went out into the world totally without any values. And he met a lady many years later who was singing his hymn, Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. And he said to her, Madam, do you realize I wrote that hymn? And she, he said to her, I wish, I wish that I had the same joy in my heart and my life that I had the day I wrote that hymn because now I am empty and I'm alone. And his biographer wrote this about him when he summed up his life. He said of Robert Robinson, he says, he went out like a ship without a rudder into the wild seas and he crashed on the rocks of unbelief. Why? Because he had bad companionship, bad relationships. Be careful of your companionship. Be careful of your relationships. As Paul said, be not deceived. Don't kid yourself. Evil communications corrupts good manners. Let us pray. Lord, we thank thee for this warning from thy word. We pray that we would hear your voice talking to us this morning. Help us to choose the right companions, the right friends, the right life partners. But we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.